don't do anything I wouldn't do. Today, travelling by lift is completely taken for granted. The experience, though, of travelling at high speed in a completely sealed box, propelled up and down by invisible machinery and often uncomfortably close to complete strangers, can still be quite unsettling. In this programme, Rex and I are going to look at the history and workings of this slightly unnerving machine. The basic idea of a lift is extremely simple. You just need uh, a rope and, uh, and a pulley. Right, Sam, right now! Simple gadgets like this have been used for lifting people for centuries. But the problem is safety. If the lady let go, her lover would plummet to the ground. Particularly on building sites, riding up and down on unsuitable devices was widespread until recently, despite the risks. The history of the lift is really the history of making this sort of travel less dangerous. Although at the time, nobody seemed too worried by the risks. All this changed in the mid-19th century, largely due to an American engineer called Elisha Otis. He added these uh, teeth to the guide rails and this ingenious mechanism to the lift itself which locked into the teeth if ever the rope went slack. Otis's idea was that if the person pulling the rope let go or if the uh, rope broke that the lift would automatically lock and uh, wouldn't fall. To prove its safety, he took it to the Great Exhibition in New York in 1853 and performed daily demonstrations. Despite the success of his invention, Otis himself had a rather tragic life. He was a hard-working, strict Presbyterian mechanic whose enterprises kept failing. <coughs> he started life running a sawmill. Hmm, things look bad. I'll have to diversify. Why don't I make something with all this wood I'm sawing up? Huh? Ah, that looks good. Yeah, who could resist this beautiful thing? Uh-oh, looks like everyone can. Never mind carriages. Everyone needs to sleep, don't they? And I'll build one of those little contraptions to, to lower the bedsteads down to ground level. Hey, mister, uh, you want to buy a bed? Forget the bed, buddy. Can you make me one of those elevating contraptions? It looks very safe. Otis's first commission resulted from an accident at a nearby factory where a primitive lift had killed two men. He never lived to see the success of his lifts, dying of diphtheria while his company was still deeply in debt. Diversification will be the death of me. Uh. Otis's first lifts were all built to carry freight. But in 1856, a department store called E.V. Horvout commissioned a passenger lift, advertised as a vertical railway. 
It was gradually realised that lifts could enable developers to increase the height of their buildings. Previously, five storeys had been about the most that anybody was prepared to climb. Skyscrapers, like the Woolworth Building in New York, finished in 1913, had become totally dependent on their lifts. One aspect of these lifts that caused alarm was the way the car was supported. In Otis's original lift, the rope was firmly fixed to a drum at the top, but as buildings got higher, there was more rope to wrap round, and it started to get tangled. By 1900, the end of the rope was normally being fixed to a large counterweight and merely passed over the, the drum at the top, gripping it by friction. At first, this seemed very daring. Surely the rope might slip. But in fact, the friction of a rope passing over a pulley like this is considerable. Capstan winches use this effect to lift enormous loads. Just wrapping the rope round once, although the capstan's completely smooth, I can lift Rex off the ground quite easily. And as capstans are normally used, if I wrap it a few times round, I can lift him off the ground with no effort at all. Even wrapped round once, the friction is enough to stop a lift rope ever slipping. Lifts still use this arrangement with the motor at the top and the counterweight on one side and the lift itself on the other. Once this idea of balancing the weight of the lift with a counterweight had been accepted, it had the advantage that it greatly reduced the power needed to make the lift work. I've added an extra four stone to balance my weight with Rex's exactly, and uh, we should now be able to go up and down quite effortlessly. OK, ready? ready. There we go. Up I go. Whoops! <laughs> 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 Whoops. You're going to hang on this time. Another major improvement introduced in the 1890s was wire rope. Yep. Compared to the hemp rope used previously, it has incredible strength. This is a testing rig for ropes. The rope is fixed in a steel frame and then pulled by an enormous hydraulic ram. This rope broke at a load of 124 tonnes. That's equivalent to supporting nearly 2,000 people. So that means that each one of these wires could support five or six people before it breaks. As people started to accept the safety of lift travel, lifts became status symbols, particularly for hotels. The basic design of lifts has changed little in the last 80 years, and it's been realised they're an extraordinarily safe form of transport. It's actually statistically safer travelling by lift than climbing the stairs. This lift is supported by seven ropes sharing the weight, and each one of them is capable of carrying the whole lift by itself. Even if they did all break, there's yet another safety device called the governor. If this rotates just 10% too fast, this disc starts to come out and catches this switch, turning off all the electrics. If it goes slightly faster still, this uh, whole disc locks up completely. This pulls in wedges under the car, jamming it against the guide rails. The modern equivalent of Otis's safety.